It's a great pleasure for me to be here to uh, present to you some of the activities which we've been uh, involved at uh, the University of Augsburg. And um, one of the big topics which we are investigating is really the coupling between light, sound and matter and uh, employing such radio frequency surface acoustic waves. And we heard a, a number of talks here of going along that direction. Uh, I would like to stress that what we are looking, um, uh, our understanding of light here is light at optical frequencies. So here we are not looking at microwaves. These are optical frequencies, so light in the wavelengths range, let's say from uh, 1.5 micron down to uh, a few hundred microns. And this light we can interface, not with superconducting qubits, but we can interface them with optically active semiconductor structures. And here you can see actually a a simulation which we performed where we evaluated the strain profile interacting with a single quantum dot located uh, slightly below the surface of a gallium arsenide chip. So um, I think I can keep this pretty uh, short. So we are employing here surface acoustic waves and we can excite these Rayleigh type waves on various types of piezoelectric substrates. We can make chips where we have complex uh, arrangements of interdigital transducers and can then probe, for example, like in this example, this is a lithium niobate chip, for example, individual semiconductor nanowires which are located here in this active area of this uh, surface acoustic wave chip. And in particular, we are using here the coherent propagating phonon field to control and also probe the, such nanosystems at hypersonic frequencies which is actually the frequency range where our surface acoustic waves live. So uh, the sound waves, as we all know, have a long-standing tradition in um, interfacing quantum nanosystems. And until now, there was basically two major approaches. One was based on using the piezoelectric field, which accompany the surface acoustic waves. And you can, for example, dissociate excitons in semiconductor nanostructures transport individual charges in a quantized matter, or even play ping pong with single electrons between two uh, electrostatically defined quantum nodes. So these are mostly electro, uh, acoustoelectric effects. So here the electric field plays the dominant role. On the other hand, we have uh, the interaction of the sound wave with light. This is an acousto-optic effect, and you can make nice super lattices to uh, manipulate polaritons. You can play with optical resonators. Or you can also uh, look at uh, individual quantum emitters, semiconductor quantum dots. And there have been uh, quite tremendous progress also in recent years. So in all these approaches, the surface acoustic wave is uh, basically a tuning mechanism, a, per a strong perturbation to the system. And very recently, these approaches have been brought now to really to the quantum domain, and there have been some uh, groundbreaking experiments along that direction where really signal phonon effects have been observed for the first time and there are now also theory proposals which uh, 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 show the generality of this approach where the analogy between light uh, photons and sound phonons have been uh, highlighted very nicely. So I think we all here in this audience agree this is a good reason to love our surface acoustic <laughs> waves and uh, uh, do some fancy experiments and do some nice physics with them. So I'm coming from the semiconductor optical spectroscopy domain, so I'm mainly investigating, I have been investigating for the past 15 years or so, semiconductor quantum dots, and my favorite quantum dot system are, is the most established one in this field. These are the so-called self-assembled quantum dots. This is actually, um, and since we also have some students here in the audience, I wanted to give a very brief introduction what these structures actually are. So these are semiconductor heterostructures and then can be fabricated, for example, from two optically active semiconducting materials, gallium arsenide and indium gallium arsenide. These two materials have slightly different lattice constants. So when you deposit indium gallium arsenide on top of a gallium arsenide wafer, you first get a two-dimensional layer. And at a critical thickness, island information becomes energetically favorable and you get these nice little lens-shaped objects which you can embed in a gallium arsenide matrix which, ha uh, which has a higher band gap and confines both the electrons and the holes in these quantum knots. And here you can see an overview spectrum taking from, taken from a few millions of these quantum dots and you can see very nicely that they exhibit a harmonic oscillator-like shell structure. And what's important for the interaction with the sound, 
waves is they also come with a two-dimensional channel. This is precisely this wetting layer where these dots are sitting on. This is a two-dimensional quantum well. And this will be later important when we look at uh, acoustoelectric effects. So from this spectrum, uh, this does not really look like an artificial atom yet because you're probing here millions of these atoms and all of them have uh, different sizes. So this is homogeneously broadened. But if you really uh, zoom down to a single quantum dot, and this is something which has been studied over the past 20 to 25 years by many, many groups worldwide, so these spectra here are very well understood, you find that there are in the S shell of such a quantum dot four uh, uh, charge configurations which are optically active. And the most fundamental one is, of course, the configuration where you have a single electron and a single hole in the quantum dot, which you call a single exciton. And here in the spectrum here, uh, you can see this sharp uh, spectral line. This is precisely stemming from the recombination of a single electron and a single hole in one of these quantum dots. And since the size of these quantum dots is in the order of something like a few tens of nanometers in lateral dimension, and they are around two to three nanometers high. So uh, you get here a strong inter-particle uh, Coulomb interaction between the electrons and the holes. So if you add a single carrier, for example, adding a single electron or a single hole, these configurations here have a, a strongly altered uh, interparticle Coulomb interaction, which shifts the spectral lines to completely different frequencies. So here you can see two smaller, less intense lines. These precisely stem from recombination of such charged species. So a single exciton plus an extra hole or a single electron plus an extra electron. So this is a highly optically nonlinear system. Just putting one excess carrier in, you shift your resonance by many, many uh, optical line widths of the system. What's also important that you can access all these excitons via the, spins, uh, via the optical polarization selection rules. So you can, for example, program spins in there and play, for example, with the single spin of an electron by all optical means. So this is a very powerful system and this is, uh, there are many, many activities going on and these systems are very well understood. And um, there have been a number of groundbreaking experiments uh, along that course of time. And for example, one uh, very important experiment was the demonstration of single photon emission from such a quantum dot uh, system. So um, if you take the emission, let's say of this neutral exciton here, and send it to a beam splitter, you excite the quantum dot with a pulsed laser, you get your emission in bundles. So you have here uh, the emission impinging on this beam splitter and 50% of the light is sent here in the vertical direction and 50% is transmitted. You put two single photon Geiger counters there and you measure the correlations. So if you have now really single photons coming here, both detectors cannot click at the same time. And this is precisely what you see here in this experimental trace, um, that there are no correlations uh, at time equals zero and you have to wait the repetition time of the experiment to get a, uh, a click at the other detector again. So this is what, what, what is called the second order correlation function or autocorrelation function. And this uh, was demonstrated something like well, a little bit more than 15 years ago and it proved really the quantum nature of the light emitted from such a semiconductor uh, quantum dot. So these are really atomic-like systems and of course you can then think ahead and embed such quantum dots into tailored photonic environments to uh, study light matter interactions. So one system which we are actively studying here in this context are so-called two-dimensional photonic crystal membranes, which are thin semiconductor slabs, thickness of roughly 150 nanometers, which are perforated by, uh, by, uh, uh, by an array of air holes. So this is done by electron beam lithography. You add here a, perf a periodic array of holes in there. And by doing that, you're modulating the refractive index of the structure. So you have air and gallium arsenide, which has a refractive index of around three. So you get here a strong modulation of the, optical, of the refractive index. In the vertical mode, you have precisely one optical mode. And in the two-dimensional membrane, which you perforated, you then get the formation of a photonic band structure. This is what you can see here. This is a simulation, and you get here uh, 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 
a transmission band which is mostly localized in the, in the air and here you have the lower band which is localized in the dielectric. And these two bands are separated by a photonic band gap. And by deliberately now introducing here a defect, so it's just skipping some of these holes, you can strongly localize light here in this region, which gives you then the formation of defect modes. These are deep defects in this photonic band structure. And here you can see also in the simulation where you expect to find such modes in the system. You can nicely see these modes in the optical spectrum as sharp resonances, which uh, uh, exhibit uh, quality factors up to a few, uh, 10 to the 4. Um, so much less than you, what you get for uh, microwave uh, waveguides, but uh, here we are also looking at different frequency ranges. Um, when we now place a quantum dot here in this, uh, in this, uh, in this cavity, um, the quantum dot, the optical dipole of the quantum dot, will interact with the, with the optical field in the cavity, and you can then for example, enhance the radiative processes via the Purcell effect. And to reach a large Purcell effect, you need a high quality factor and a small mold volume. So you squeeze the electromagnetic field to a very tiny volume so it can strongly interact. Yeah? So can you place it on the loop? Exactly where you want to be um, there are approaches to do so. We, no, we are not doing that, but uh, there, are, there have been reports where you basically track down the quantum dot first and you scan your sample, and then uh, and you determine the position, and then you write the cavity around that. Ah, mm -hmm. Yeah, so th there, are, there are techniques to do so. Um, What's also important to note here is that this is a very flexible architecture. So this is a single cavity. Of course, in this, on this platform, you can also make waveguides, splitters, couplers, so all types of integrated photonic elements, uh, which you then, uh, and I will show you, we, can, we, uh, we assess here also the scalability of this approach, control these elements by a sound wave. Okay, so this is the system which we are looking at, and uh, I just want to summarize that here uh, on that slide. So here you can see an experimental uh, result where the radiative uh, emission of such a, of a quantum dot was measured. So the green transient here, which, is, which has the intermediate decay time, so the intermediate decay rate, is a quantum dot sitting in an isotropic optical medium. And the red transient here, which is fast, which has a large decay rate, is coupled to the optical mode, both spatially and, and uh, spectrally. So this is the Purcell enhanced uh, decay, and if the quantum dot is detuned from the optical mode or not sitting at the maximum of the electric field distribution, the radiative decay is suppressed and you get a very long transient, a very low emission rate. And this is what's commonly referred to as the, uh, the weak coupling regime of cavity quantum electrodynamics. In the system, you can also reach up to the strong coupling regime. So if you have a, a good cavity and a dot which is precisely positioned at the antinode of, uh, at, at, at the, anti of the field, um, you can reach the regime where you get the formation of polariton branches. And you see here the vacuum Rabi splitting between the quantum dot exciton and, uh, and uh, the cavity line. So this is the, these are the constituents, the two systems which, we've, uh, which we are mainly looking at here in this context. And now I would like to highlight a few experiments which we've been doing along here in this direction. And I would like to start with looking not at the interaction uh, between light and the quantum dot, but first look at uh, charge injection and charge um, extraction processes from optically active quantum dots. So one big field in, in this uh, in this area is to really control the occupancy state of the quantum dot by the sound wave. So this is uh, some first, uh, su uh, the first part of uh, which I will discuss here today. Then I will move on to the acousto-optic tuning of really these integrated photonic uh, elements. So the coupled quantum dot photonic systems. And after that I will show you that we can also play with the sound waves themselves and use the quantum dots as a detector to pick up the sound wave and uh, measure its, uh, its local uh, pressure profile. And if I have time, uh, I will just flash up one slide where about ideas which we've been thinking of working along where we can really uh, control the flow of light and sound uh, on architectures derived from this uh, approach here. Okay, so let me start here uh, now with 
uh, uh, showing you some results on uh, this acoustic regulated charge injection. So this is, uh, these are experiments where we use samples mainly from uh, the Walter Schottke Institute in Garching from uh, UC Santa Barbara and in the beginning we also had some sample materials grown by Andreas Wieg and Dirk Reuter in Bochum. And what we're basically looking at is now the optical emission of a quantum dot with and without the surface acoustic wave present and here uh, uh, in the top right corner you see some t uh, two representative spectra of a quantum dot, the same quantum dot, without excited optically without the surface acoustic wave and with the surface acoustic wave and you can see I think very nicely that there's a dramatic difference in the two spectra and for the uh, for, uh, and we've been putting quite some effort in understanding what's actually going on here and uh, and uh, yeah this is what I will uh, show you next and the two gentlemen who were mostly involved in this work, which I will show here today, are Florian Schülein and Matthias Weiss in his master's thesis. I will also so show some results from him. He's actually here in the audience and we're sitting in the back. <laughs> okay, so here we are looking at um, um, the surface acoustic wave charge conveyance of electrons and holes in these uh, structures. And here at this point, the two-dimensional wetting layer comes into play on which our quantum dots nucleate. So if we probe the emission of this two-dimensional system and uh, under the influence of a surface acoustic wave, we can see when we, uh, when we increase the acoustic amplitude that the emission gets subsequently suppressed. This effect arises from, uh, the, uh, from uh, the superposition of the initially flat semiconductor band structure with the electric potential induced by the surface acoustic wave. So without the surface acoustic wave, we basically have a flat band structure and electrons and holes, they see each other, they can optically recombine and we get out light from that. When uh, we increase the acoustic amplitude, electrons will be transferred to this minima in the conduction band, whereas holes will be transferred to the maximum in the valence band. This spatially separates them by a few microns, these are the wavelengths which we are working at here, and this spatial separation completely, can completely suppress the radiative emission of such a system. This um, configuration here, or this, uh, this arrangement here now also propagates with the speed of sound across the semiconductor chip and you can now control via the sound wave the local electron and hole densities, for example, at the position of a quantum dot. So in using this principle, we can actually go from a situation where we have both electrons and holes present at our quantum dot to a scenario where we have at one given time of the acoustic cycle, for example, the electrons being uh, located uh, uh, at the position of our quantum dot and then precisely in half an acoustic cycle later, we get the holes. So this is an inherently sequential injection process which is extremely difficult to achieve if you would like to uh, pump a quantum dot optically um, or electrically because you in general always will have electrons and holes present there and here you can really go to a scenario where you have first one carrier species and then the other and in this, uh, in this uh, alternating fashion. So this uh, was recognized pretty early that this might be actually a nice implementation of an acoustically uh, regulated single photon source, so like in this animation you can think of injecting some carriers in the propagating sound wave and then you have here a quantum emitter and when you, after you injected the electron and the hole you get out a single quantum of light. So this was proposed already before single photon emission of quantum dots was, uh, was experimentally verified and it then took about 10 years till Paolo and uh, his colleagues at the Paul Drude Institute uh, uh, um, uh, did a nice experiment where they saw first uh, non-classical light emission from such an acoustically pumped system. Here you can see some of our data where we used a self-assembled nanostructure and here you can also, here is the point where we inject the, uh, the carriers in our system and then we transport it along the propagation direction and you can see here nicely the airy pattern of, a f of the far field of a point like quantum emitter. This is a single, in this case, quantum post grown at UC Santa Barbara, uh, where, uh, where you can then inject the carriers. So this, is, this works very nicely and 
uh, I want to be a little bit provocative at this point. You can ask yourself the question, why did it take about 10 years till somebody did that in the end? And the simple reason is you can, the, these quantum dots are extremely versatile. You can embed them literally in any semi semiconductor nanostructure. And in particular, you can build an LED, which you can combine with a micro cavity. And if you do so, you can also get gigahertz single photon emission. And there are large activities along that. And if this is your competitor, it's, I think, a little bit tricky to uh, to, keep, uh, to motivate why you want to do exactly that with the surface acoustic wave. So this is a little bit of provocative sk statement, but uh, um, at this point, but this is, uh, uh, of course, the device, if you want to sell a device, which you have to compete at, uh, with it at the end. Okay, but nevertheless, you can do many, many nice experiments along that direction and look really at the carrier processes uh, going along in this system. So now I'm, uh, I'm uh, um, uh, want to highlight this a little bit in more detail. So um, what we've been uh, looking at is not this long distance carrier transport preferentially, but we really wanted to look uh, at, a at the most simple system where we directly excite the quantum dot. So we have now our laser focus, which has a di diameter of around a micron, which we focus on our quantum dot, and then we can turn on the surface acoustic wave. So here you can see another example of an emission spectrum of such a single quantum dot, which is pumped by, uh, our la by a pulsed laser. And in this experiment here, we have electrons and holes present at the same time at the dot. And uh, when we now turn on the sound wave, yep. here we are, we are using sound waves, uh, surface acoustic waves in the range, in the frequency range of around 200 megahertz to be compatible with the radiative processes so we can really see these states forming and uh, not modulating faster and, or injecting carriers faster than these processes actually take place. Um, you can see again a switching behavior and with the surface acoustic wave on we can uh, generate preferentially this, the neutral exciton state, so one electron and one hole, and the negatively charged exciton state here shifted to lower energy. So this here is basically the electron-electron, uh, the balance between the electron-electron repulsion and the electron-hole attraction uh, when you change from this uh, uh, configuration to that one. So, when we re so from this data, again, you can very nicely see that going from this kind of random ambipolar carrier injection to this inherently sequential uh, uh, injection, you can really program the charge state. And we can monitor that in, in more detail. So we can, for example, change the time at which our pulsed laser excites the, the quantum dot. So we can, for example, excite the system in a, in a, here at the node of the surface acoustic wave. Here we have the maximum electric field. So we will move electrons here to the left and holes to the right. Or we can also choose configurations where we inject electrons or holes in a stable point in the band structure. And as you can see here nicely, when we tune now this stroboscopic phase in this experiment, we can switch between the negatively charged exit from the negatively charged exciton to predominantly the neutral charged exciton and back to the negatively charged exciton. So the, strop, uh, the time at which we excite our system really programs the charge state of the quantum dot. And, um, but at this point, you have to be a little bit careful because what, we, what I'm showing you here is a time integrated spectrum. So we are detecting over a long time and in particular over many, many optical, uh, acoustic cycles. And what we completely neglect and what you can't resolve in this type uh, of experiment is actually the time evolution of this process. Because when we inject the carriers, electrons and holes will redistribute and be transported by the sound wave. And, the, and this will then uh, basically program also the future pr the processes which take uh, along in the, f in the future after the photo excitation. And moreover, although we are detecting here these lines in parallel, they do not coexist. So the quantum dot is either in a neutral or in a charged state. So we do not have any time information when these states are formed in, from this simple stroboscopic experiment. So we, re we went from this time integrated experiments to time domain experiments. And I want to show you just one example. So we did this over the whole range of uh, phases. And if you're interested in the detail, you can look that up in this paper. There's also some modeling coming with that where we link that to the trajectories of the electrons and the holes. 
But in principle, here is just one example where, we, where I selected the case where we generate electrons at an unstable point in the band structure and holes in a stable point in the band structure. So what will happen here is that the electrons will redistribute to the side minima and the electrons which initially moved uh, in the opposite direction then the propagation of the sound wave will be transported back to the position of the quantum dot half an acoustic cycle later. And we, would, we were interested if we can see that really in the optical spectra. So uh, we, this is again the time integrated spectrum at this co these conditions. So you have here the neutral state and the charge state. And now we monitor the time evolution of this emission process um, uh, and after photo excitation by the laser. So here you can see this time transient recorded from the neutral exciton and here at this time the laser excites the system and you can see that the signal of the neutral exciton immediately turns on, so which means that we preferentially generating electrons and holes at the same time at the same number in the quantum dot. So here the signal turns on and then it decays fairly rapidly. When we now measure the time transient of the negatively charged exciton, so one electron hole per plus an excess electron, we see that this emission is very unlikely to happen uh, with at the time of the photo excitation, but it actually increases and then shows a pronounced maximum at the precisely half an acoustic cycle after the photo excitation. And at when this process happens, the uh, emission from the neutral exciton disappears, which tells us that we are at this point converting a neutral exciton to a charged exciton, another optically active species, um, by injecting an uh, electron by the surface acoustic wave. So this really shows you this regulation of the charge injection process. And we exercise this for different relative stroboscopic phases and you can link these processes directly to the trajectories of the electrons and the holes in this acoustically uh, 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 modulated band structure. Uh, question. I can see that this process may happen, but why is it so incredibly efficient that it grabs all <coughs> the neutral excitons and converts them? Um, probably, well, it, it, it might be a balance also. So, um, it's the cross section of such quantum dots is fairly high. So that um, it's so. So the microscopic nature of these capture processes are, are, are fairly complex. So I don't have a really good answer for that. And capture into uh, two quantum dots is a topic on its own. Um, so for this species of quantum dots, we happen to see uh, predominantly the negatively and the, and the uh, charged exciton and the neutral excitons. We do not see good signatures of the positively charged exciton where you would expect similar things to happen. There's only a very faint modulation with that. So, um, this depends from quantum dot to quantum dot, but nevertheless, what, you, what we can fa fairly safely say is that this is a, a, a kind of a general property. So we see very similar effects for quantum dots localized in nanowires. So you get similar phase modulations. Um, so this tells you that this acoustoelectric transport is really the, the driving mechanism, but there are of course contributions from the quantum dot itself. So we also did experiments on columnar structures where we have a very wide transport channel where this acoustic, uh, acoustoelectric transport uh, is very efficient. There, the switching is much more digital. So you can really switch off one species and turn on the other one um, because this acoustoelectric processes are more efficient. But this is, oh no, yeah. There also seems to be a little bit of a revival in the blue curve. Yeah. So, so how do you understand that? Um, this could. Uh, this could be, this is the time when, the, when um, so holes are not very efficiently, not as efficiently transported as electrons. So you might have some holes which come, which initially stayed at the point of photo generation and you pick them up later. And um, this uh, would be a time where then holes come by. So um, if, you, if you read the full paper, we also, we, we see that, that, that we can link the neutral exciton to the holes and the negatively charged excitons to the electron. Uh, in terms of the trajectories. Yeah. So it means that we're not actually moving the hole so much in the acoustics rather than only the electrons, isn't it? Um, it depends on the amplitude. 
on the amplitude. So this is, this is in an intermediate power range. So we studied that uh, also at different acoustic powers. And when you go in an intermediate power range where the uh, whole transport starts to set in, you get then uh, such bl blinking behavior which persists over a longer time. Uh, because uh, yeah, you have a finite chance to pick up the hole with, uh, in, in the maximum of the conduction band. So this is a fairly complex structure. Um, um, and yeah, and in the self-assembled dots, you're suffering quite a lot from the fact that this wetting layer, this quantum well, is very thin. So this transport is very inefficient. So the mobilities of these electrons and the holes, which in the end, in the end dictate the acoustoelectric properties, they are uh, uh, fairly low. But nevertheless, I hope I could convince you that we can really regulate the injection of carriers in the sound wave, uh, in the quantum dot by the sound wave, and of course. You would also like to do the opposite thing. Uh, for example, generate optically electrons holes in the quantum dot and then, for example, remove one of these carriers from the quantum dot and transport them over macroscopic distances. This is something which is tricky to do with a optically active quantum dots because they have tremendously high confinement potentials. And we happen to see actually this process, not on these epitaxial dots, but on quantum dot-like systems which are forming in nanowires. So we've been studying here um, gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide nanowires, which, where we had a gallium arsenide core uh, overgrown by an aluminum gallium arsenide higher band cap shell. In this structure, we happen to have also a quantum well in this, in this shell, which is at this point not important. What's important is when we looked at this spectra of these nanowires, we, we saw an emission band of very sharp, discrete emission lines at higher energies. This is different from what you've seen before. And before, the quantum dot was the lower energetic system. Here we have the inverted situation. We have quantum emitters which are at higher energy. And at that time, there was a very controversial discussion going on where these lines actually come from. And there was a proposal that these are perfectly ordered little prismatic nanostructures which form in these nanowires, or they are just natively occurring defects and uh, which are randomly distributed. Well, um, we, uh, so Matthias did in, during his master's thesis studied these nanowires, and he, uh, when he uh, looked at uh, these emission centers with the surface acoustic wave. So here you see a stroboscopic scan over two acoustic cycles. You can actually see that we have, again, emission lines which are anti-correlated in intensity. So if you look here at this upper line, it gets darker at this spe specific uh, uh, stroboscopic phase and another, another, another line pops up in the spectrum, which tells us that there is some regulation of the charge state also in this system. And this is something which we could not explain in the first place because we were pumping the system optically below the band gap of the barrier material. So we do not have carriers in a, in, in a continuum of states from which we can inject them into the dot. And um, in order to have something like that happen, it has to be the inverse process because we have here a continuum of states which are empty at lower energy to which we can uh, transfer our uh, carriers to. So this is actually some fowler lohr -time, uh, type tunnel process which you can drive by the sound wave. So this is actually related to the uh, vertical electric field component of the surface acoustic wave, which is uh, here normal to the semiconductor heterostructure. And if we have here somewhere our emission center, which is separated by a tunnel barrier from, the conti from a continuum of empty states, we will have initially a, a certain tunnel rate which occurs there. And when the electric field is in this scenario oriented to the right, we can raise the barrier, we can block the tunneling, or when it's oriented to the left, we, we lower the barrier and we can favor the extraction. And you can model actually this process with, uh, with uh, a Fowler-Nordheim-like tunneling model which was developed 30 years ago for MOSFETs for tunneling through the oxide for the gate leakage. So exactly this model describes our data here in this case. Uh, and this was actually, we were pretty excited about that because we never uh, expected this to happen, that you can really take out the carrier which you optically or program in the quantum dot and then transport it by the sound wave because of this high potential. But actually these nanowires might be fairly um, attractive systems to do so, so you can really think of having some kind of protocol where you're on one end of the nanowire, have a quantum dot which is at higher energy, you program for example a spin or a charge in there, tunnel it out with the sound wave, 
and then transfer it along the nanowire. And on the other end, you have a receiver dot where you can inject it again and then reconvert that to a photon. So this could be a scheme if you would like to, uh, to for an on nanowire kind of quantum state tra transfer. So programming optically via the selection rules, a spin, transport it along the nanowire and then inject it at another sink, another quantum dot which you have at the other end. Um, and in our experiments, we basically have now shown that both processes are at least uh, experimentally observable and uh, in suitable systems. Okay, so that much about carrier um, transport. Now let me move to the acoustic optic control of nanophotonic systems and this we did, uh, we were mainly doing with the group of John Finlay and Michael Kaniba at the Schottky Institute and initially we also studied samples from Dirk Baumeister and Per Petrov at UC Santa Barbara and uh, Stefan and Matthias have been involved in the experiments, which I will show here. So here we were looking at the modulation of these photon of photonic crystal nanocavities by the sound wave. And um, as I explained to you, this periodic array of holes forms a photonic band structure, so it's basically a mirror. So you can think about the system as, a in the simplest picture, as a Fabry-Perot resonator, where you have the two end mirrors determined by the ends of, this, uh, of our uh, defect. So if we now have a surface acoustic wave or any sound wave propagating ac across this structure, when we have a, no a node in the center of the cavity, we will get no def net deformation in the structure. So on one side it will be compressed, on the other side it will be expanded. So in this situation we will have our mode at the original wavelength. When we have now a maximum amp uh, of the amplitude of the sound wave in the center of the cavity, we get net and extension, which will shift our optical mode to longer wavelengths. And another half cycle later, we will have the minimum and our mode will move to the left, to, lower, uh, to uh, shorter wavelengths. So this is an acousto-optic effect and uh, it's actually very nicely reproduced by such a simple Fabry-Perot model. So this is where very, very comes down to, and you can also control, for example, that the tuning bandwidth scales with the amplitude of the sound wave. So here you can see some um, uh, representative experimental data on this tuning mechanism. So this is a cavity mode uh, with a decent quality factor of around 10,000. And when we turn on the sound wave, we see that this mode broadens in the time integrated spectrum because now the mode will move back and forth uh, between uh, the external points of this dynamic modulation. To really show that this is dynamic, we can do an experiment where we again keep our laser fixed at a, fer a, fer a certain time during the acoustic cycle and then take time transients as a function of photon energy or wavelengths. And by that we can step by step uh, monitor the dynamic modulation of this cavity, what you see here for example very nicely and you can also see that you get more light close to the turning points because there the mode is moving slower than here on these fast edges here. So and overall this whole emission is damped because you have an um, exponential decay of the, of the cavity emission. So this works very nicely and for a cavity quantum electrodynamic system you also have to take into account the dot and the dot, dot also has a spectral response to the sound wave via the deformation potential. And in the simplest picture you take the hydrostatic pressure induced by the sound wave um, at the position of the quantum dot and um, from that you expect a, also a sinusoidal modulation of, uh, the, uh, of the emission energy um, of uh, such a quantum dot. And you can check that in a, again in a stroboscopic experiment. You can just tune the laser across the, the, the sound wave and take spectra at every uh, stroboscopic phase and here you can see an example of such a deformation potential mediated uh, modulation of a, a quantum dot in the time domain again. So this is here a nice sinusoidal modulation. of the thing. What's important here is that it's the local hydrostatic pressure which drives this. So it's given by the derivative, the spatial derivative of the displacements. And uh, this will be important later. You can also look at these um, quantum dots at high, with higher spectral resolution. So this is a nice experiment which was performed at NIST where you can actually see then the acoustic sideband because these quantum dots have very nice um, and sharp 
uh, optical resonances, so you, for the dots you can easily reach the si uh, resolved sideband regime, which is important for parametric uh, control. For the cavities, it's a different story there, the line widths are much larger, but for the dots, this is certainly not a problem, and this has been done. So what I will show you now is that we can now control the interaction between different quantum systems, and this is uh, on this platform, so this is uh, analogous to this little toy here, where, for example, the ships could be our cavities and the pirates are our, uh, are our uh, quantum dots, and we can now use the sound wave to control the interaction between dots and cavities, or cavities and cavities. And I want to start here with the cavity-cavity coupling, because it's the simpler, uh, conceptually simpler experiment, because I basically have two harmonic oscillators which I couple to each other. But this experiment nicely tells us that we can scale up this approach so that we can turn on and off interactions of the photonic components. And you can very easily in this platform make photonic molecules by just placing two of these cavities close to each other and it turns out that it's a smart idea to do that in this uh, not uh, aligned but here slightly displaced. And if you do that, you get normal, mo uh, normal mode splitting um, between the two cavity modes and when the detuning is zero, you get nicely bonding and anti-bonding optical modes confined in these cavities. However, when you fabricate these cavities, they typically do not come out identically. So if we uh, now do an experiment and look at the saw modulation of such cavities here uh, with modulation amplitudes smaller than the coupling strength, which is expected for the system, you can see when we look here on the left cavity, we get one modulation at one distinct wavelength, which means we have one optical mode. And if we look at the other cavity, we have an antiphase modulation um, um, and uh, also at one distinct wavelength, which tells us that initially, as fabricated, these structures are not identical. So there's no, the detuning is non zero. Uh, but nevertheless, we have here an antiphased uh, modulation, and when we now increase the acoustic power, you can nicely see that we get now anti crossings of the optical emission in this system. So here you can see that when we look here at the left cavity, we start off here at this lower branch, then we have here two lines. This means we are bringing our system into resonance, we get the splitting in the bonding and the anti-bonding mode, then we have again one mode, so our, our initial decoupled system is restored, and then we have here a second time event where this uh, coupling is restored again. And you can nicely model that by a simple coupled pendular coupled mode uh, model, as you can see it here. Yeah. This is just uh, a photon tunneling between the two cavities. So this is evanescent field. So yeah, this this is so, and this happens to be most efficient along this diagonal direction. This is where you have the preferential loss in the structures. So yeah, don't put them like that, but like that. And by changing the distance, you can change the coupling strengths. And here we set it in a way that this is in the range of what we can do with the sound wave. And you can, uh, so the only free parameter in this model is the coupling strength, which you can assess from this type of simulations very easily. So this matches one to one. So, and it tells us very nicely, this is the simplest coupled element which you can make, and it behaves exactly the way you would, uh, it should, which is a, a good thing if you would like to scale up a system. So if you're already struggling at that stage, then it will be hard. <laughs> The coupling between the cavities, uh, well, ultimately you end up with a, with a single cavity, uh, which is just longer. Uh, um, so in this case, uh, well, it depends on the architecture. I, I, don't, I, I don't have the number here. Yeah, but, yeah, but uh, uh, what Pierre is referring to is the strength of the coupling. I have somewhere a slide where you can see we, here. Oops, this is not what I wanted to show. This is what I should see in the end. <laughs> so you all come to Cagres. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't find it again. So we evaluate, this is here, the coupling strength uh, as a function of separation between the cavities. And you can see here you get up to yeah, 10 to the 13 hertz. And we were operating here uh, because there, uh, the, the, this coupling strength is comparable to the amplitude of the, um, of the modulation of the sound wave, so we can nicely resolve that. If you're operating here, your sound wave is just a small perturbation, and if you're operating over here, you run in the limit of the line width. So there's a sweet spot for this proof of principle experiment, which we deliberately picked at this point. So. <laughs> 
And we also seen that this coupling strength is robust. So this is for several of these photonic molecules, you always get the same because it's just a separation. Okay. So these are the sound waves and the photonic molecules. But of course, you can also couple a dot to this system. So single cavity, single dot coupling. So um, here you can see a trace where we, um, <coughs> uh, where we tuned uh, the optical mode and the, and the optical li line of a quantum dot by tuning the temperature of our system. And you can see here at low temperatures, our system is detuned. And here at this particular point, the two systems come into resonance. We do not see polaritons, which means that we are in a weak coupling regime. And when we now keep this temperature program detuning fixed, so if we, for example, go here at this resonance, we can again look at the time evolution. And what you see here very nicely is that we uh, initially start off with a very low intensity. And then we have here, uh, at a well-defined time, uh, emerging an increase of the optical emission, uh, which corresponds, which is occurring very close to zero detuning, where the quantum dot comes into resonance with the, uh, with the optical mode. So we go from a Purcell suppressed system to the Purcell enhanced system and to the Purcell suppressed system again. And to prove that this is really not just a charge conveyance effect, we can change this detuning and see if this uh, time at which the emission gets enhanced shifts. If it would be charge injection, which could also happen potentially in this structure, this would not shift. Uh, this would sh uh, this, um, this um, charge injection should not depend on the detuning between the dot and the, and the cavity. But in our experiment, we indeed see that this time shifts, which tells us that it's really this programmable um, uh, resonance. We also performed an Henbury brown twist uh, autocorrelation experiment uh, by, uh, at this uh, uh, wavelength where the dot comes into resonance with the mode. And here you can see again very nice photon antibunching. You can also see that this here is modulated, so there are there's clearly modulations in this autocorrelation trace. And when you Fourier transform this whole beast over several microseconds, which, uh, so this is just the center part which I'm showing you here, you find all the frequencies which are involved in the experiment. So it tells you that this single photon emission which comes here, uh, uh, which we see here, is very precisely regulated by the frequencies which are involved in our experiment. So the modulation frequency of the saw pulsing the laser repetition rate, and of course the saw, uh, saw frequency. We see them all very nicely in the experiment. So this is all a Purcell regime. Of course, you can dream of going to the regime where you have uh, polariton states, and then you can drive so-called Landazena Stückelberg transitions with the sound wave, because we can now tune the, uh, vary the detuning between the dot and the cavity in the time domain. And in this famous landau zehner stückelberg problem, um, the transition, uh, the probability that you s do not follow these adiabatic states, which we see in the time integrated experiments, depends on the speed at which we tune to the, through this resonance. This is the famous landau zehner transition probability. And if you do this very fast, this probability is one. So, if, for example, you prepare in our system the exciton and you tune through the resonance, you zehner tunnel through the resonance, and you end up in the exciton state. If you do that at exactly the right speed, you can, you can end up with a probability of 50%. And by doing so, you can generate uh, maximally entangled bell states in our system between the exciton and the photon in the cavity. And this could be driven by the sound wave. So to make this short, we can model this. So we can uh, calculate the prefactors here of this uh, uh, of this wave function. So if this is a maximally entangled state, we would have here uh, our um, uh, square root of uh, uh, 1 over square root over 2. And um, we can calculate that for a realistic parameters. So these are all experimentally demonstrated parameters, which we used here as input parameter and quantify the degree of entanglement by calculating the so-called concurrence of the system. And what we've shown is that it's actually possible with realistic experimental parameters to generate such entangled states with a concurrence with a, of more than 80%. And this entangled state lives basically as long as the photon lives in the cavity, so a few tens of picoseconds, of course. So this is, but this uh, uh, we showed here for our various sets of parameters that this is actually experimentally feasible. You can do that. 
uh, with surface acoustic waves. Okay. To do these experiments, you also would like to have fast tuning slopes, and in order to get that, you would like to actually freely program your acoustic waveforms. So this brings me to our phononic pu pulse shaper. So um, in the electromagnetic domain, pulse shaping or uh, shaped electromagnetic pulses are used over the entire spectrum, so from radio frequencies to optical frequencies to control classical and quantum systems. So in NMR, such uh, shaped uh, RF pulses are used to initialize spin states or at optical frequencies you can use them to uh, control coherences in atoms and molecules. And uh, this is actually a real, versa a very versatile and very general approach and uh, it's used over the entire electromagnetic domain and we were asking ourselves can we also do that in, for a nanomechanical wave and transfer this paradigm from optics to nanomechanics or more, to be more precise can we turn such a conventional surface acoustic wave to something like that. And just from looking, to, from looking at these movies you see that this, is, this, this thing should be more powerful than what you can do with this uh, kind of standard boring surface acoustic wave. Okay, and in order to do that you can use uh, a principle which is also used in this musical instrument. This is a so-called Hammond organ. And if you read the patent of Lawrence Hammond, he states here in the beginning that any sound can be, uh, or tone can be uh, analyzed uh, with, uh, into a fundamental tone and certain uh, higher harmonics, which we would call a Fourier series expansion. And you can do the opposite way. So thus most, <laughs> most is interesting at this point, musical tones may be produced by a definite combination of fundamental tone and various proportions of harmonics. This is what we call an additive Fourier synthesis. And this was then improved, so you ended up with structures like that in the end, a couple of years later, and we wanted to do the same thing with sound waves. So what we did is we designed transducers, which allowed us to generate not just a fundamental surface acoustic wave, but, other, but also different harmonics. And in particular, it's important that you not only get the uh, um, the odd harmonics, but also the integer harmonics, so you can really do full-fledged Fourier synthesis. We can then do that uh, very easy uh, by just uh, hooking up a number of signal generators to a uh, uh, sending IDT. We pick up the transmitted signal on the other side uh, with an oscilloscope to a Fourier analysis, and with that we stabilize the faces here on that side. So if you have a fancy arbitrary waveform generator, a generator, you can do this just with one get gadget. We had to do it like that. Um, and to prove that we really have this nanomechanical wave propagating here in between, we use our quantum dots as nanoscopic strain sensors. So we have these dots which have a size of a few tens of nanometers, and these will pick up the local strain profile of this waveform. In order to get this correct, I will. Uh, you have to take several things into account. So this is now an example for synthesizing a square wave modulation of the quantum dot. So in order to get a square wave modulation, the hydrostatic pressure at the position of the quantum dot has to be the square wave, which in turn implies that the, um, since this is, but this here is the derivative of the displacement, and the displacement scales with the electric potential. So you can uh, uh, integrate this, you get this waveform here, this is the displacement, the, uh, the, um, the black curve, and the red curve is then the corresponding piezo potential, which is also the signal which you should apply to your IDT in the end. And this is what the actual waveform then looks like. And you can see here color-coded the, uh, the potential again, and the little arrows here are the, the field directions. And if we do so, in, we see that our quantum dot, which initially, which you seen a few slides before, was uh, modulated by a sine wave, is now modulated by a square wave. So we have really here a digital switching between these two charge states, uh, uh, between these two energies. And this was done here by superimposing three components of, uh, 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 for the Fourier synthesis. Um, so here you can see it now again the, um, this data analyzed. So here you can see the sine wave modulation. The red uh, line here is the programmed waveform. This is the square wave modulation. Again, the red line is the programmed waveform. And these two waveforms you can make or synthesize just by using the odd harmonics. If you have also the even harmonics, you can make asymmetric waveforms. 
And these are actually the ones which are interesting because you have, have slow and fast slopes in, this, in the game. And here you can see an experiment where we did this for, uh, with, a, with a sawtooth wave. So we have here a slow slope and then we have here an abrupt jump. And this is uh, reproducing here again. And of course you can just add up a cosine function and you get something like a delta pulse. And this is what you see here. This also works. So you have here a nicely uh, programmed um, minimum of the sound wave, uh, of, the, of the quantum dot energy, which occurs only at a very small time in, uh, window, which is basically given by the time resolution of this experiment. You can Fourier uh, analyze that again and see that this is actually matching what you uh, would like to get. OK, so uh, with our techniques, we can really nicely um, also play with the sound waves and just highlighting a few perspectives. So if you, if you would like to interface these photonic systems with the sound wave, you're facing the challenge that these membranes are very thin compared to the acoustic wavelength. So you have a high acoustic impedance mismatch. And we calculated what actually this strain profile should look like in this structure. So this is what we get for our structures like we use them right now. This would be one of these photonic crystal membranes. So this is not looking perfect, I would like to say. So ideally, you would like to have a structure where you really guide light and sound at the same fashion and go eventually to such optomechanical waveguides where you can control the flow of light and sound. And if you then come along with, uh, with acoustic pulses, which uh, uh, allow you to generate uh, different frequencies, you can do all kinds of uh, nice acoustic uh, spectroscopy, acousto-optic spectroscopy. And actually, this is not that, uh, that uh, far from reality. So very recently, a paper came out where the sound wave was piped into an optomechanical cavity. And you could, uh, the uh, interaction between light, sound, and mat uh, light and sound was demonstrated uh, on such a platform. So this is, not, this is actually uh, fairly exciting and I think very um, uh, topical uh, research area in this case. OK. So let me close here and flash up again the advertisement which you've seen before. So I hope we see you all in Congress next year. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the advantage is that it's getting more and more tricky if you go to higher frequency to excite these sound waves with sufficiently high amplitudes, which is important in our experiments. So if you have an approach where you can work at a fundamental frequency, which gives you a, sl a relatively slow mod uh, modula base frequency, and then you only have to add small fractions of the higher harmonics, which might be less efficient to generate them, but you don't need as much amplitude so if you to, to generate them. So this is, this is uh, from a practical side, uh, an advantage. Of course, you can tune the slope by just making the amplitude larger because it's the 2 pi and the amplitude and the frequency which come in. So the, the, if you just use a sinusoidal modulation, you just crank up the amplitude, you get also a higher slope. But this, uh, by using these higher harmonics, you can basically go to, let's say, a square wave where you have initially a very high slope at the point where it switches. In the beginning, you mentioned that when you wake up, it will turn out because they will be separated. Mm -hmm. and so you will see the PL initial be suppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, then you see the same thing with your quantum dot. Uh, in the quantum dot, not because uh, initially because the quantum dot is a deep center, so it's difficult to get the carriers out of this quantum dot uh, once they are in there. And the relaxation times are in the order of tens of picoseconds, so the electron and the hole, they uh, relax very rapidly into the dot, and then it's difficult to get them out. This is why we don't see this extraction process for these conventional dots that nicely, or not in a regulated fashion. So we have we happen to step across that in a situation where we have to dot at higher energy and then we tunnel into something. Um, 
um, this is the reason why, and actually you can, there, there are many effects which go out uh, along uh, at this place. But, uh, let me just show you that. So, but what we can show is that really when we look at the trajectories, we, so uh, in the data which I've shown you, we have initially the electrons and the holes at the position of the dot. This is propagation of the sound wave. This is time. And you can see that the holes move in their valley. The electrons redistribute and then you get them. And it's basically balancing the optical excitation power in a way that you uh, can uh, monitor these processes very uh, nicely. In your uh, membrane cavities, you yeah. have um, uh, modulation, with energy modulation of the order of 1 mm -hmm. uh, Is that a photonical uh, modulation or is actually more modulation of the band Can you separate it from the position? So there's a, it is a, co is this a superposition of the, of the uh, photoelastic coupling, so the modulation of the refractive index and the, and uh, and uh, just a geometric effect. And we took that also into account once. And I think the photoelastic actually slightly it did, it sl strongly depends on the wavelengths, the magnitude of that. But it should be, a, I think, a little bit stronger than the pure geometric effect. But they are in phase, so you can still apply this fabry perot model um, because they just add up. Um, and at certain wavelengths, they add up more than uh, at other ones. The dot is a little bit more complex. So for the dot, uh, this strongly depends on the dot. In your acoustic synthesizer, why do you need feedback? Why do you need feedback? Um, because we are using different uh, generators, and they are not perfectly a long time stable with, with respect to the relative phases. So you have to compensate for phase glitches if you go to more than two components. <laughs> and if you have an arbitrary waveform generator, this waveform generator does this for you. <laughs> so it gives out the waveform which you would like to have. And here we had to do kind of the poor man's approach, get all the signal generators from colleagues and <laughs> hook them up <laughs> to, to one experiment. And then we had to stabilize them like that. But it, if you do so, it works very nicely. If you have a waveform generator, use that. <laughs> That's my. <laughs> not wise at this point. <laughs> mm -hmm.